Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Kimmy and Alans. Of course, Kimmy from the dock. Don't be fooled by the rocks that she got. She is still Kimmy from the dock and we are having a great time already. I love everything about this conference so far. JD's keynote session, praise and worship with the team. We are very, very blessed. And hopefully that is gonna continue because we have some real ground to cover for these next few minutes. And hopefully it is inspiring, points you towards the things of God and encourage you that His kingdom is moving forward. This session might be called the Art and Justice session. It might be called uh, whatever you want. But if you're taking notes, I've called this session Arrows. And obviously it's a theme that runs through the conference. If you're listening to other sessions, you've already heard JD talk about it. But one of the key verses for this session is found in Psalm 25. It says, My question, what are God worshippers like? Your answer, arrows aimed at God's bullseye. So let's begin by asking, what is God's bullseye? And what does it mean to hit the mark? Like this is me doing archery. That's me hitting the mark. Micah 6 tells us in clearly locuted detail, what does the Lord require of you, but that you see that justice is done, let mercy be your first concern and humbly obey your God. See, your creative nature is an arrow. It is a gift from God designed to help you transcend the present and speak at a higher level than your words or language might allow. Your creative gift is a tool for you to fulfill Micah 6. It's your very creativity and act of expression that pierces the noise around you, calling those you reach into a narrative too easily forgotten in the noise of the daily grind. God has given you this gift, this creative fingerprint inbuilt in you for a reason. And when you realise your chosen medium of expression and pursue it wholeheartedly, well, three things happen. First, it focuses your inner life. Second, it arrests the attention of others. And third, it demands a response. But for your chosen medium to become art, well, it has to tell a story. Good art tells a story. It has story at the centre and good artists for generations have captivated our attention through story, through narrative, through imagery. Whether it's the Beatles who wrote Abbey Road and created a whole lexicon of characters and places, they had the multiverse going before the Marvel even thought about it. Maybe it's all kinds of different creators like Mark Twain, the father of American literature. Or we could go back to the greatest era of music, the 1980s and hair metal. And if I tell you that Johnny used to work on the dock, if I tell you that Tina worked a diner all day, if I then tell you we're halfway there, you already know what to say next. We are living on a prayer, my friends. Or maybe for you, it's the world of television. And maybe if I told you that no one told you life was going to be this way, you already know what happens next. The first 50 people to put the four clap emojis in the chat, I will finish this session by singing the entire Friends theme song, Not A Word Of A Lie. Maybe you're more a Seinfeld person. Who thought that a show about nothing could capture 20 years of cultural attention? If you're like me, maybe you're more a West Wing person. I still honestly tear up when I hear the West Wing music come on. If it's the world of cinema, maybe it's the art of Bong Joon-ho or Jordan Peele or Akira Kurosawa or Ava DuVernay, all incredible auteurs, all with an amazing gift, all people who use story to connect an audience with a message. However, your work becomes true art and it's elevated when it begins to serve a deeper narrative with higher ideals. See, good art becomes great art when it speaks to people's inner condition, when it helps them see truth that was prior to hidden, when it speaks to their core needs, needs like safety, protection, justice, family, faith and worship. And at the centre of so much great art through history, we find a familiar theme of justice. We find a familiar theme of truth unpacked in ways that language could not simply express. The installations of Oliver Eliasson teach us about our responsibility to interact with our built and natural environments in a way that makes dominion understandable for everybody. Pablo Picasso in 1937 painted Guernica. He brought worldwide attention to the horrors of civil war in Spain. Maybe it's Bob Dylan. He wrote the song Hurricane, told the tale of boxer Ruben Carter, who was profiled and wrongly imprisoned for decades. Some people wonder if Dylan's song actually contributed to his case being reviewed and Carter ultimately being released. Can you imagine a song having the power to change laws, to overturn wrongful convictions? 
Harper Lee, when she wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, spoke to what the author called a code of honour and conduct far beyond what was visible in society at the time. It showed us the fruits of the Spirit and the power of reconciliation in a way that few writers ever had or would. And it lifted the thinking of a generation. You could talk about the writer, Thomas Keneally, or then Steven Spielberg, who made the film Schindler's List. It won seven Academy Awards. It is always in the conversation for greatest films ever made. But more than that, it showed the audience the beauty and sanctity of sacrifice and the power of a life devoted to the service of saving others. It speaks to our greatest values and highest levels of character at one of modern man's darkest periods. Up here, we have a little detail from Rembrandt's The Return of the Prodigal Son. It's a painting that speaks so clearly about our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our fallenness, His forgiveness. Our delusions of grandeur and His grace-filled love for us, His children. It rewards your attention with a deeper understanding of the goodness of our God and what it means for you and me. Maybe in the world of music, it's Bach's St. Matthew's Passion, a piece of worship from one of history's greatest composers. That work reveals more about the nature of the Godhead and the generosity and sacrifice of the cross than words alone ever could. It's a theological masterpiece disguised as a piece of music. Now, all these works of art across so many different mediums transcend through the noise of culture and daily life because they tap into the secret of art's highest purpose. Your work becomes art when it begins to serve people. When your art becomes about service and not success, you are realised as a creator. Your work is no longer about your own fulfilment, your own execution or your own exhibition, but it's about how it can empower and uplift others. You become an artist when you help people see and understand truth, not just feel it. And truth isn't difficult to grasp, but it is costly. Perceiving truth requires two of our highest details and our highest traits as creators, humility and bravery. And as followers of Jesus, as committed Christians, we are tasked to see this world through His eyes. We are called to shine light in dark places and reveal the truth as it is, not as our culture might suggest that it is. And the truth is this, the Word is our anchor and biblical justice is our mandate. The mightiest and most significant art of all time is God's Word, without question. It envelopes multiple literary genres. It spans 1500 years of human history. It holds the very best of early civilizations, culture and conversation across three continents. Over 40 authors speaking vast and diverse languages, written by peasants, poets, scholars and songwriters, kings and killers. Yet somehow the Bible is the most fascinating, forward-thinking, life-affirming, timeless, but perfectly timely piece of art humanity has ever known. The Bible is the story of God at work, saving mankind through the finished work of Jesus Christ and His Kingdom now here on earth. And Scripture is the story of what God cares about most, His Kingdom. His people. It shows us to be His hands and feet, what it means to be His church, His bride. And the church, capital C, is the greatest agent for biblical justice the world has ever seen. When it's in its sweet spot, the church's benefits to society are immeasurable. The church addresses poverty. The church nurtures biblical values and protects the weak, the orphan and the widow. The church serves young people, families and the elderly. It assists in recovery for people who are lost and for neighbourhoods that have suffered. The church builds communities through programs and education to value and serve humankind. And in real life today, this translates to lower crime, higher levels of elder care, genuine disaster relief, helping recovery in individuals, families and relationships, and much more. The church, yeah, it's flawed. It's imperfect. It's made up of people like you and me. So I can already tell you, it's as messed up as I am, but it is God's bride, God's hands and feet, and God's chosen vessel for the outworking of His kingdom. And this church that God has promised to build, it's you and me, artists, creators,
Christ followers, people who have been tasked with building and serving what He cares about most, His people. So truthfully, the Word is our anchor. And as we understand that, we understand our place in the Kingdom of God. And the second thing we said is this, is that biblical justice is our mandate. The greatest commission of all time is to serve God's people and take the Gospel to the ends of the earth, to His sons and daughters in faraway places and around the corner. God's desire is for all to know Him and to be joined to Him on earth as it is in heaven. And when we serve the least of these, we elevate our gifting from being about what we can create with our hands to what we can create with our lives. We go from being creatives who just receive and get input and are encouraged and inspired to creators, people whose work serves a purpose. Serving strangers and lifting lives, we'd never reach otherwise. Scripture is so clear on this. And as we first saw in Micah 6, this is our role and our time to do something with what we have. If you're anything like me, you're very well aware the time for blame shifting or expecting somebody else to step up is over. It is now our time to live out this Scripture. But in today's world, where things can seem to be going from bad to badder to badderer, it can feel really hard to make a difference. So let's talk quickly about the world as it is, but not as we actually know it. See, if you're anything like me, you kind of open your phone at some point in the day and the news just always seems to be bad for the first four or five scrolls. And then you kind of turn on the TV and the TV is full of bad news as well. And then you kind of jump on a podcast and it's either a true crime. Pro- I had no idea there was so much crime until I started listening to true crime podcasts. So much of life around us tells us that the world isn't what it should be. And that's true. Plus, we all have our own biases. Psychologist Steven Pinker says that we are biased towards negativity. We erroneously expect our own destruction. And the data is real and the data shows us the facts. Let's have a look. Every year, 300,000 women die from pregnancy related causes. This means that on every, any average day, 830 mothers die. The majority of the world, 65% live on less than $10 per day and almost 10% live in extreme poverty, meaning they live on less than $1.90 per day. The world deforested 47 million hectares of forest in the last decade. That's an area the size of Sweden. And I can tell you, I have some Swedish friends, they would not be impressed to hear that. 60 million children of primary school age are not in school. Almost a quarter of the world's population, 23%, live under autocratic regimes. 3.7% of all children die before they are five years old. This means that 5.2 million children every year and on any average day, the world sees 14,200 child deaths. 14% of the world's adults do not know how to read or write. These are real numbers. And every single one of those numbers is a story. But something you would have learned in your artistic journey as a creator is that somehow taking a wider view gives us a more complete picture. As creators, artists, we need to take a step back from the, ma- from the micro of our work and look to the macro of our work. If you're a producer, sometimes you spend all this time tuning a vocal, you have to pull back and listen to the overall track. If you're a painter, you're working on the detail of the hand holding the Bible, you need to step back and look at the overall work. Yes, the detail matters, but you need to see the development. Get out of the minutia and see the overall progress. Seeing with the eyes of the Creator gives us a different, broader and more well-rounded perspective on what's actually happening. So let's zoom out and look again, not just at the data, but at the development. The number of women who die from pregnancy related causes almost halved from 530,000 in 1990 to 300,000 per year, almost halved. People living in extreme poverty fell from 21% to less than 10% in the last decade. People living on more than $10 a day increased from a quarter to a third. Global deforestation has declined threefold from 151 million hectares in the 80s to less than 50 million hectares in the last decade. The number of primary school aged children who are not in school has almost halved from 110 to 60 million. 
The share of the world living in autocratic political regimes declined from 45% in the 80s to 23% today. The share of children who died before they were five years old declined from 9.3% in 1990 to 3.7%. That number is down from 12.5 million to 5.2 million, less than half of what it was, praise God. And the share of the world's adults who learned to read and write increased from 70% in 1980 to 86% today. Bringing biblical justice is achievable today. And this tells me two things. One, there is still an enormous amount of work to be done. These numbers are real and horrifying in so many ways. Our world needs the church to stand tall, for believers have a bias towards action and not just attention. Jesus never said, take my couch underneath you. He said, take my yoke upon you. Take my way of doing things upon you. There is work to be done. And Jesus invites us into it with Him. After all, we are what we do, not just what we post. And second, the world is better than you think. The overall trends that we just saw show the kingdom of ground advancing, taking ground in ever increasing ways. And today we can have direct impact. For example, the church behind me you see, the Sagrada Familia, it was first started in 1882 in Barcelona. It's been over 150 years almost, and it's still not finished. Today, you can create a piece of art with a phone in your hand, scrolling with your thumb. We are an instant generation. And while this has so many disadvantages, it also means that we can create culture. We can speak to the culture and we can change the culture in an instant. We can do more with the flick of our thumb than previous generations could do in a lifetime. To fully realise your art, you must point to truth and to create it, you must first live it. And there is so much good already being done and so many ways we can help. Now I wanna talk about two organisations we wanna position front and centre at this conference. The first of which is Open Doors. Open Doors has been smuggling Bibles into places close to the Gospel since 1955. It was started by a Dutchman, Brother Andrew. He had no education and his time as a commando left him lame. He was shot by a bullet in the ankle, but he wanted to fulfil the work of God on his life. Years and years of struggle led him to say, yes, I will, but I'm lame. Yes, but I have no education. God sent him anyway. And the story of Open Doors has continued ever since. They've been getting the Word of God behind the Iron Curtain into the persecuted church and supporting Christians who don't have access to the Word of God. And today there's an exciting project that we can be a part of. But first, let me tell you a story. In 1979, Open Doors delivered 30,000 New Testaments to Southern China. An amazing number, a huge number. But soon, however, a message came back from the church leaders. The Bibles were not enough. We need one million more Bibles. Open Doors was up to this challenge. And by 1981, Christians in China, who at that time were forbidden from gathering at a church or even owning a Bible, many of them were imprisoned or tortured or killed for their faith decided that it was time. So 40 years ago, a plan was hatched to smuggle 1 million Bibles into China overnight. It was called Project Pearl, happened in 1981. Thousands of people across the world supported six missionary crew members as they boarded a tugboat that would smuggle a million Bibles onto a secluded Chinese beach at midnight. Most of those six believers had never even been to sea. Project Pearl, you may have guessed, was a success. The nation was flooded with New Testament Bibles and the good news of the Gospel. China has never been the same. The legacy of 40 years ago is now ours to carry into a new generation. Open doors and their work matter so much. It's not as simple as just downloading new version. In so many countries, internet access is highly restricted or blocked altogether. But here's how you can help. For $20, you can put a Bible into the hands of a persecuted believer. Your gift of a Bible will go to a persecuted Christian in countries like Iraq, Vietnam, Colombia. We believe that every Christian should have access to the Bible as it transforms the hearts of individuals, cities, and ultimately nations. So there's information on your screen. There's a clickable banner just below me here. It's perfectly positioned, color coded with my shirt, very well planned. Would love for you to click through, decide how you can help as be part of this conference. The second organization to talk about here is Compassion. 
Compassion, you're familiar with them if you've been to any one of our conferences before. They have been building families and communities for over 70 years through many avenues, one of which is child sponsorship. They've been involved in nation building at a grassroots practical level with boots on the ground for decades across multiple continents. Child sponsorship isn't just a good idea. It's one of the ways you and I can personally respond to the biblical mandate to love our neighbour and care for the vulnerable. Back in 1952, Reverend Everett Swanson founded Compassion. He was there to minister to troops in South Korea and he was changed forever by the conditions and poverty he saw and how he saw it affected the children there. He was walking through the cold Korean winter when he felt like a kid, like a street rat, kind of grab his overcoat and run off. So Reverend Swanson kind of chases him kind of through the, the village and through the neighbourhood and eventually chases this kid to a warehouse, an abandoned warehouse, kind of bombed out warehouse and finds that there's a whole bunch of street kids who are just trying to use those coats and whatever they can find to keep warm. He thought something was being taken from him but it was actually those kids who gave something powerful to him. He knew that he had to act. He came back the next day with jackets, as many as he could find. And it was from that experience that compassion was born. He was moved to create something that would impact generations and outlast him, a true artist. His art outlasted him and outlived him and is still being carried out today. It was an act of service with untold impact for generation. And of course, there's so many powerful personal stories from the field. The work of compassion is about adherence to the values of the kingdom, especially when it costs us something. So ultimately, we as believers and as artists are called to engage with our world in ways that produce flourishing communities. And truly, our creative authenticity is only as strong as our biblical integrity. You may have been to previous conferences hearing us talk about child sponsorship. The reason we just saw the trends changing, the reason we see the world improving and getting better is because of organisations like Compassion who are in the field taking a direct action in these areas, who have helped well over 2 million children receive sponsorship. Compassion provides an opportunity to attend or stay in school, medical care, safe, healthy and nourishing meals, mentoring in a safe environment through connection to a local church and the opportunity to hear the message of Jesus. So again, there's a clickable banner below. There's information coming on your screen. I would encourage you as this conference goes on, decide what you stand for and the kind of creative you want to be. One who focuses on empowering others and living out Micah 6 on being an arrow. Your art is elevated when it serves a greater purpose than yourself. The greatest thing we can do with our gift is to point it like an arrow at the heart of what God is doing. This conference is our chance to again unite art and justice and faithfully serve the Great Commission together. Your art, your creative gift, your expression, whether it's musical, whether it's photography, filmmaking, design, origami, fire breathing, I don't care, you do. And what's most important is God has given you your gift for a reason. It is an arrow when placed in the hands of God, but it is your choice if you're gonna remain on target. Russian novelist and author Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, art isn't what you do, it's how you do it. So how will you choose to live? With art and justice working hand in hand? Choosing to serve a higher narrative and speak truth to people who need it. Take time to consider your next arrow and how great an impact you want it to carry because this is going to be our moment. This is going to be our time. We believe that the work that has been done before is powerful, life-changing and has shaped generations of believers. But it is now this generation's time to stand tall, to be counted, to make art that doesn't just inspire ourselves and just result in a few like buttons, but actually changes communities and societies. I pray that for our next couple of hours together over this conference, that you wouldn't just be inspired and encouraged, but that you'll be moved to act and moved to create, that you would be an arrow. I'm excited for all that's ahead, believing for God to do great things, excited for what's coming up. God bless you. Gabriel Kelly, that was, excep that, <laughs> that was exceptional and spectacular. You are profound and the way that you communicate biblical justice and truth is ridiculous. Yeah. 
Thank you for caring for the oppressed and the poor and the persecuted and the marginalised like you do, for using your creativity and your gift to actually stir our hearts. I've been watching the chat and people are profoundly impacted. So thank you. Oh, thank you. High five. I don't think I can high five you. High elbow. Uh, high elbow. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Here's the thing. When we were planning and praying about this session, um, I don't think that we had even thought about the fact that it would turn into what it just was. So thank you. But more than that, I guess I want to encourage everybody not to just go, wow, that was so impacting. Yep. But actually right now to take a minute and act, like actually do something. Because together, like Gabe was saying, we can make a huge impact. We can actually push the globe forward. We can push the world forward and we can, we can see the gospel actually take, um, take action, take heart. So let's do it. Um, as a little girl, my mum made me post tracks into Poland and communist countries to make sure that the persecuted church had access to the gospel. That's so cool. So I love that at this conference, $20 can get a Bible into the hands of people who don't have access to it. Is that right? Absolutely, and it's so powerful that people can contribute such a small way with such a massive impact. Okay, I always think it's funny because I go, we've got the internet, so you can access version. you can access everything. Like, But the truth is there are countries in the world where there is censorship and they do not have access to you version and the things that you and I have access to. That's right. So let's make a decision conference that over the next 24 hours, we are gonna do something to yeah. actually make a difference to open doors and also to compassion, which I believe the guys are gonna be talking about more tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yep, the guys will talk about more in United Hour and it's gonna be great. I love it. It is, yeah.